good morning everybody and um, my name is devendra das sharma i'll be talking about universal chiplet interconnect express uci for sort and how that's going to be or that's being used as uh, an interconnect for constructing socs or sips different terminology but effectively things that are in chips large chips today they're getting disaggregated into smaller chiplets and uh, we'll talk about uci as an industry standard that enables that so with that here is the agenda for today we'll give a brief overview of uci express as an organization uh, we'll talk about on package interconnects what are the opportunities and what are the challenges there uh, do a little deep dive into uci uh, also talk about uci 1.1 which is recent uh, we introduced that with uh, we made that announcement during flash memory summit of this year uh, talk about uci usage models and then uh, future directions and conclusions and of course we'll have questions and answers so uci it's an open industry consortium we have 120 plus member companies uh, we started or made the announcement in march of 2022 we incorporated in june or july of 2022 uh, so we started off with uh, 10 promoter companies and then you know it's of course grown to 120 plus uh, over the year and we elected two new board members so there are 12 total and uh, pretty much if you look into the uh, membership list of UCI, it's the who's who in the area of semiconductors, packaging, IP suppliers, foundries, cloud service provider, and you can look into the board members that are listed here, right? So pretty much all the foundries, all, all of your you know, ma major ASCs, all the CPU vendors, GPGPU vendors, you know, memory vendors, storage, all, all of them are represented in UCI, and we'll talk more about that. So organization is a little over a year old, right? And of course, uh, as always, we are open for membership and, uh, you know, together we innovate, right? This is modeled after PCI Express, CXL, NVMe, all of those open standards. So I did talk about, you know, the timelines and all of that. There are two levels of membership. And, uh, you know, after this slide, we'll talk about UCI as a technology, but there are two levels of membership. Uh, the contributor level and adapter level. And, um, you know, you can read through the details here. But fundamentally, if you're a contributor, you get to participate in the work groups and provide input into the direction of the specification, how it should evolve. And if you're an adopter, uh, you get the specifications. And of course, you get to participate in um, conference and all of those things and get the IP protection as per the uh, agreements. So that's in a nutshell, and a company decides whether they want to become an adopter or a contributor, that's up to the company. So, and then, you know, uh, as I said before, uh, board members get elected for a fixed term, and then, you know, you go for election again. So now let's talk about the on-package interconnects, right, up level, and talk about what are the opportunities, what are the challenges. Uh, we'll start off with, you know, one of the Great technologists of our time, Gordon Moore. Um, he is very well known for his 1965 seminal paper, cramming more components onto integrated circuits, which basically, you know, that, that paper became famously known as Moore's Law, which basically predicted that the number of transistors is going to uh, double every two years in, a, in an IC, integrated circuit. Now, interestingly, in the same paper, he had predicted the day of reckoning, and you can read the quote there, but basically what it said is that in the future, it might prove to be more economical to assemble smaller chiplets and connect them on the, uh, on the package, right? And that day of reckoning is already there. If you look into the way volume CPUs are being made today, GPGPUs are being made today, doesn't matter whether it is client, server, CPUs, it's basically a bunch of chiplets that we connect them together on the package uh, using, you know, so far what people have been doing is using their own proprietary interconnects to connect them together, right? And it's what I call a scale-up solution. 
So, the first driver today, right, for the on packet chiplets is, uh, you know, there are two aspects. One of them is reticle limit, and the other one is around yield optimization. So, we are all up against reticle limit because the demand, whether it is for compute, whether it is for, you know, storage, memory, whatever, right, the demand is just insatiable, right, and we need to deliver tremendous amount of processing and memory capabilities within a given package. And all of us are up against the, what is known as the reticle limit of the die. There is only so much you can print on the die, uh, beyond that you just cannot go, right? And, and still be viable. And of course, larger dies, it's well known that larger dies in the more advanced process node uh, yields a lot uh, less than smaller dies, right? So that's fundamentally the reason why a lot of uh, lot of companies, right? Not just my company, our competitors throughout the whole industry. You will, if you look into the way they design their, for example, CPUs today, it's a bunch of chiplets that are packaged together. Okay, so one is to overcome the reticle limit, and the other one is the yield optimization. And effectively, you know, if we look into it, the primary goal is to deliver scalable performance. It's what I call a scale-up solution. For example, if I need to put together hundreds of cores together on a given package, I, I can only fit, uh, let's say, you know, pick, pick, a, pick your favorite number, let's say 64 only in a given die, then I'm going to put two of them to do 128, maybe four of them to do 256, or, you know, pick, pick whatever is the number that you want to do, right? But uh, that's basically the means in which uh, people are delivering this. There is another thing at play here, which is the increasing design costs and the picture on the right, it was a study done by a bunch of organizations, uh, uh, most notably in, uh, cited in the IEEE uh, HIR, Heterogeneous Integration Roadmap, that basically did a study about different components, you know, uh, just for IP porting. This is the IP porting costs that are going up with the more advanced process node, right? So the, the, um, so the question is that, if you, if you look into, for example, any given die, you have a lot of ingredients in there or components in there that are not really changing. So every time you do a tape in, do you need to then go through and pay for all of these costs or are you better off just putting those IPs in a separate chiplet, that, those that tend to not change as much and then assemble them together, right? So there is uh, that part of the economics that comes into play. Um, and of course, you know, uh, if you did that, uh, I'll give again, again an example. On, on in our case, of course, you know, we want the compute dies to be in the latest and greatest process nodes. But that doesn't mean that you know the memory, the I/O, right? All I mean, I'm an I/O guy, but you know, it's not changing as fast, right? I mean, if you look into PCI Express, the evolution is every three years, right? So I would like to reuse those um, as much as I can while the compute dies are changing to the most advanced process node. Uh, and not all segments need the, you know, all the uh, latest and greatest, uh, um, you know, uh, I/O or memory. So uh, there is something to be said about reusing those chiplets. Uh, of course, time to market, late binding, right? If there is a functionality that is unknown, or rather, let's say, if you are trying to decide on something, let's say there is an acceleration functionality. Uh, that still is in flux and you have a longer design cycle, you, you can basically go ahead with the rest of the chiplets, you know, uh, tape them in, and then if this chiplet is ready, you can package them, and there, there you go with your uh, solution. Or you can, you know, uh, it's quick, quick to make a turn in terms of a, just give a different package, as long as you're socket compatible, in our case, in the platform, you got your solution, right? So it enables those kind of late binding things, it also enables us to do bespoke solutions, right, which is basically custom silicon. Different customers have different needs. Different usages have different needs, different types of acceleration functionality. So one choice is, of course, you know, you can um, build all of that in the same die and just have a bunch of uh, areas in the silicon that are unused. Otherwise, you can just offer just customized solutions, right? You can just say, hey, um, this percentage of my compute, memory, and all of those things, I.O., memory, all of those things are the same. If you want a different acceleration functionality, bring your accelerator or I'll, I'll design it for you. You can package them and you get your bespoke solutions that way. 
And of course, we all know that different process nodes are optimized for different functions. I mean, today that is at play, for example, on package memory. The memory is in a different process node than the compute, and we, you know, we know how to build those, right? Uh, but you know, that this becomes more and more prominent, especially as we are moving in the latest and greatest process nodes that, you know, they're trying to be, they're, they're getting more and more specialized, right, for a bunch of challenges. So things like analog functionality, you know, you're better off, or co-packaged optics is a good example, right? It, it needs to be in a very different process node than, let's say, your latest and greatest compute dies. So these are the drivers for on-package uh, chiplets, which needs to be connected together. Then comes the question of, okay, if we want to think about interoperability at a chiplet level, at a package level, what are the ingredients? And you know, there are four sets of things that come into come to mind here, right? Um, I'll go from the bottom to the top. One is the die-to-die -die I/O. So this is the physical layer, right? So everything from like you know bump arrangement, signaling, you know uh, voltage levels, link training, initialization, scrambling, you know lane reversal, all of those things, right? We need to figure out. It's an important ingredient, but it is not the only ingredient. Right, you need to think. We need to think about this picture in a holistic manner. It'll be equivalent to somebody just gives you a service and then say, "Hey, go make your NVMe work." Right? It's, you know, you need to define the entire stack. Right? Say. Of course, you need to have the die-to-die -die protocols. So things like data link layer for reliable transfer, things like transaction layer for you know transactions. So you know things that are very common in, uh, at a board level, right? PCI Express, CXL, we know how to do. And then, of course, there are streaming usages, uh, like people build scale-up systems, right? We, for example, we use QPI to build two sockets, right? So there will be those kind of usages. Those all need to be enabled, and you need to make sure that there are plug-and-play IPs. Um, the other one is around SOC construction, right? Uh, the application layer level, which is, you know, how does the reset work? How does initialization work? You know, wh what happens with, uh, you know, register access, manageability, security, all of these things needs to be thought through and uh, incorporated. And then, of course, the form factor at, you know, what is the die size, what's the pump location, what's the power delivery mechanism. So these are the things that needs to be thought through and at least, you know, you give the right guidance so that the, you know, you, you will, you're going to get a plug and play kind of ecosystem. And again, I go back to the model of PCI Express um, kind of thing where, you know, if you define a slot, we just say, hey, here, here are the signal pins, here are the sideband, here is the, you know, here is the power, here is the clock, and off you go, right? And people know how device discovery works, all of those things, right? All of those have been, uh, has been shown to be plug and play. So this is the same kind of thing. So where do we really want to go with all of this, right? And this is a picture that shows three levels, right? On the leftmost side, you have things that are today working really well at the board level, right? So you got maybe CPU to CPU connection through, in our case, QPI or, you know, in our competitor's case, some other link, mostly PCI-Fi based, by the way, right? You got a bunch of slots, right? Um, you know, whether slots or cables doesn't matter, but those are PCI Express or CXL. And you got memory through the DIMMs. You procure things from different places. You plug them together. They just work. You want to have the same model at the package level. So what you see in the second cut in the second cartoon over there is you know some compute, some acceleration, an IO tile to give you the external. I mean that doesn't mean the board goes away. The board will still be there, right? But this is at a much more tighter uh, uh, tighter level of integration, right? And then you got on package memory, right? For example, the amount of bandwidth that you get in the middle picture is, we will see those numbers. It's, uh, it's a several orders of magnitude better than what you will get at a board level, which for good reasons, right? And then of course the ultimate is on die integration, right? When you decide that, hey, you know, I just want I just have a smaller die. I just need to integrate all of this because of this particular usage. So you should be able to take things and put there. And this integration, at, and then by the way, we talked also about how the on die integration is moving towards the middle one because of uh, reticle limits and those of that. So that arrow also needs to move in the other direction. So, you know, with all of these, uh, you know, the we, we want to make sure that we have the same IPs, the same software stack, you know, the same subsystems, all of that, that can seamlessly go across 
these continuum, right? Otherwise, you are going to have to reinvent the wheel every single time, right? So the vision is that, uh, you know, it's the same thing that moves across, so that way you get the best uh, customer experience, and it's a very quick time to solution uh, uh, approach. So those are the, you know, the, those are the challenges and those are the opportunities, right? With every opportunities, there are a ton load of challenges. So I wanted to be upfront about, you know, where, where we are going to face all of those. And then let's talk about UCIE, which is an open standard for chiplets. So, you know, I've listed four guiding principles for UCIE. These are, again, modeled after very successful, multi-generational, multi-decade standards that several of us have been involved in. PCI Express, CXL, NVMe, you know, uh, personally I haven't worked on USB, but you know, USB, my, my team works on that. And uh, first is of course you need to have an open ecosystem. You need to ensure that things are plug and play. People are not going to invest to be in somebody's jail, right? It has to be an open ecosystem. It needs to be backward compatible whenever it evolves. And that's there for making sure that your investments are protected. And you know, again, going back to our example, if there is a chiplet that I don't need to do the process porting to a new process node, why would I? That's part of the value proposition. So, and again, the way I get that is through a backward compatible evolution. Um, and you know, of course, you know, there are places where we have broken the backward compatibility for good reasons, like PCI. We went from bus to link-based thing, and. That's fine. Even there, we figured out a software way of doing backward compatibility and you know those kind of things. But those are those are very well thought out transitions, right? We don't change things on the fly. We don't change change things between you know a Gen one to a Gen two to a Gen three in PCI, right? All the way right now to the Gen seven. They're all fully backward compatible. We of course need to deliver the best power, performance, and cost metrics across anything that people can come up with. It needs to come from the standard. Just there doesn't need to be any reason for somebody to go and reinvent this wheel, right? So in other words, if you have the combined power and innovation capability of a you know, 100 plus member company, you should be by definition doing the best. That, uh, and then of course continuously innovate because the computer landscape as we know is changing. You know, uh, these standards, they, if you done properly, they last for decades. Right, uh, PCI, we just went through, last year was three decades, right? 30 years uh, that we have celebrated, right? Of completion, of driving successful standard. This is going to last decades. So now, you know, I, I talked about the challenges. Of course, some of these are a repeat from there, but uh, the motivation here is, of course, first thing is that we want to align the industry. Things that have happened at a platform level very successfully, we want to replicate that at the package level, right? And a package is the new SOC. I and mean, some people call it SIP, system in a package or whatever, right? I mean, we, we can we can, uh, we can talk about terminology, it doesn't matter. But effectively, your package is the new SOC. That's where innovation happens. And of course, you know, all the problem statements we talked about, reticle limit, time to market, lower portfolio cost, right? Uh, pick the optimal process node, smaller dies, you know, will yield better. All of those things need to hold, customizable solution. And basically the picture on the left shows the vision of that, right? If you want to think about it, there is a sea of cores in one or multiple chiplets. There is going to be, you know, your customer IPs, customized chiplets uh, that you're going to put in the package there. There is going to be memory, on package memory. There is going to be I.O., right? All of those needs to come out of this. And they just, this is basically heterogeneity, right? Not that, you know, all the, all the cores or all the, uh, uh, you know, customized uh, things needs to be with respect to, for example, a single um, uh, ISA-based uh, uh, chiplet, right? It, it, you know, you should be able to do mix and match. Our platforms today are mix and match, right? So, we should be able to do the same thing. And and by the way, the other important thing is that this mix and match needs to be across chips that are designed not only in different process node but also in different foundries, and you can assemble them anywhere, right? For example, again, go back to the board example, right? 
your CPUs can come from whichever supplier, your DIMMs are coming from whichever supplier that you pick, your PCIe cards are coming from whichever supplier you pick, right? And they are coming from a variety of sources and you are able to assemble them and they work, right? And that's the vision here. So there are, again, uh, you know, um, very successful standards. Uh, if I look into what are the things that have contributed to the success, there is, of course, two sets of things that come across, right? And you can come up with more than two, but hopefully this captures the essence. One of them is, of course, key technology metrics, KPIs, key performance indicators. These are effectively your quantifiable numbers. And the other one is, as which is on the right-hand side, a set of things that people really look for, right? These are not quantifiable, but equally important, right? So on the key technology metric side, you got bandwidth density in this context. And you know, we'll give both the linear as well as aerial density. If you just give linear, you're like, you know, you can just say, hey, my uh, circuits are going to be, um, you know, uh, narrow and all, and you can, this thing, right? And so you have to look at both the, both, both the angles to, be make, to make sure that things are, um, you know, um, things make sense, right? Uh, energy efficiency, very important, right? Again, why is bandwidth density important? Because if I am uh, on package, I do expect very high bandwidth, otherwise I would have been off package, right? My, again, my energy efficiency needs to be really good, otherwise I would be going off package, right? Not just the peak energy efficiency as measured in picojoule per bit for transfer, but also we want to make sure that we are doing really good from a scalable energy consumption point of view. And by that, what I mean is, if I consume 10% of bandwidth at a given time, I should ideally consume 10% of peak power on that particular interface. Now, I said ideally, because we all know there is going to be, you know, um, time to turn things on and off and all of that. And basically, that's the next point, which is very low idle entry and exit time. And you should be able to save substantial power when we are in that low idle state. Latency is an important aspect. Channel reach is an important aspect. You know, technology migration, all of those, right, are important. Reliability and availability, these are important criteria. And cost, uh, which is, you know, so you'll see that we support both standard and advanced package. Now, on the other side, you have things like interoperability. Is there an, uh, you know, is, is it a full stack? Is it going to be plug and play? You know, can you, can you run an existing set of software? Is it discoverable, right? Can I, you know, can I uh, isolate things or do I have to redo my software stack for every one of these uh, interfaces that I'm doing? Uh, need to support different usages and segments, because otherwise you just end up becoming a niche. And, you know, here the um, just like PC Express, the goal is that everything from handheld to client to server to you know supercomputer, whatever th is the usage model, right? Automotive, all of those needs to be comprehended. Uh, technology, uh, um, technology independence, so across process nodes, uh, packaging options. We have to think about the power delivery, cooling, you know, all of those things, right? Debug, all of those are important. And of course, most important is broad industry support and an open ecosystem. You can check all the other boxes. If nobody is in the party, why would you invest? Right. So there needs to be something that you know, uh, ensures that there is going to be deployment. Right? So we have uh, started UCI with, uh, we started it with these things in mind. Now let's talk about UCIE, uh, uh, you know, 1.0 specification, and it's a layered approach, okay? So we all are very familiar with layered approach, and uh, you know, you got physical layer, uh, which is shown there. There are three layers. Physical layer deals with, you know, things like, as I said before, everything from form factor to link training, lane repair, you know, voltage levels, all of those things are comprehended, right? Clock, clocking, your know, analog front end, we we'll even have sideband for um, a bunch of interesting things that we'll talk about. Die-to-die uh, -die adapter, which is responsible for the reliable delivery of protocol, along with support for multiple protocols, because we realize that we live in a multi-protocol world, right? So people want to be able to do multiple protocols, CXL being a prime example, and we'll talk about some other examples, right? So that's the die to die adapter. And that's basically the scope of the UCI specification because uh, we do expect protocol layer to come like 
PCI Express is a well-defined protocol. CXL is a well-defined protocol. As I said, there are streaming protocols um, that are there. We also define a raw mode, like if you are doing, let's say, just a service, a networking service, an Ethernet service, right? You have your Ethernet stack. So we, you know, in that case, it's fully understandable that you just want to use the physical layer, connect to the Ethernet service, and then go to your stack. Uh, so that's the raw mode support. And um, you know we have a well-defined internal interfaces, which is unique for UCI. You'll see that there is a raw die-to-die -die interface and a fleet-aware die-to-die -die interface, so that way you can do the mix and match of IPs. So these interfaces are specified uh, internal IP interfaces within, within the UCI spec. Uh, config registers at every uh, in each of the layers for device discovery and all of that. And you know, of course, form factor management, we will talk about compliance, and we talked about plug and play IPs with RDI, FDI interface. We have two types of packaging right now, 2D, 2.5D. So 2D is the picture on the top left, which is the standard package, and it's for cost-effective high, uh, a longer distance, and the bump pitch there is anywhere from 100 to 130 micron, you should interoperate. Somebody is 100, somebody is 130. They will interoperate just like at the board level, right? You got chips with different bump pitches uh, or packages with different bump pitches. So instead of package uh, sending the pin out to the package, you are connecting them within the package, right? As shown in that picture, that at a substrate package substrate level. Uh, the other option is the other choice is two and a half D, which is the advanced package. This is for power efficient. Uh, high bandwidth density. And by the way, the standard package, you can go up to 25 millimeter. On the advanced package, the distance is two millimeter. So these are, you know, next to each other kind of dies. A lot of wires go, very low bump pitches. Bump pitches go from 55 micron down to 25 micron. And you will interoperate, we'll see that. And these dies can be manufactured anywhere and you can assemble them anywhere. So we gave three examples. Uh, top one is, Intel's EMIP, Mid middle one is TSMC's COVAS, and the bottom one is AS's FOCUS, right? Three examples, not meant to be an exhaustive list, but at least goes to show that uh, the technology works across anybody's packaging technology. And one specification covering it all. Uh, by the way, 2D and 2.5D, and they don't intermix because you've got such a wide difference. But as long as both sides are designed with 2.5D, uh, even though it's the designed to the same spec, there are some differences, and, and mostly it is the bump pitch difference. Um, UCI-5, uh, we have uh, UCI as, as a whole is architected with uh, process portability in mind and working across uh, different types of packaging options. So we specified, uh, and also we understand people will do things like die rotation, mirroring, all of those things. So th those are comprehended in the bump layout. Left picture shows the standard bump layout, so there you will have signal pins, you are going to have the sideband pins, you are going to have the VDD, VSS, all of those things. Of course, you know, don't try to read that because it's compact, but at least shows you the thinking there. And if you have like a stacked bump out in the bottom one, it's basically 1.143 millimeter on the die edge, that's the sore line. And in the die depth side, you got 1.32 millimeter or 1.54 millimeter, depending on whether you are below 24 gig or above 24 gig. Advanced bump out is the picture in the middle there. The important thing is, so standard, it's easy to make it work, right? We have made it work on the board, so you can route them, especially with the 25 millimeter routing, you can, that's relatively easy. Uh, advanced is where the challenge tends to be, and the way we solve that problem is, you know, you got, for example, it's easy to say both are 55 micron bump pitch, right? Then you basically you connect, right? And, you know, if you are given the bump out, you know what to connect with whom, and so you go through the connection, and that can, that's through the advanced package. The challenge is that, okay, if one is 40 micron and the other is 55 uh, micron, or 25 micron, for example, right? So the way we uh, solve the problem is we have a fixed beach front, which is 388.8 micron on the sore line. Doesn't matter whether you're 55 or you're 25. That's, the, that's basically the sore line that you have given 
uh, with that particular bump out. And then what you do is that now it becomes an easy thing to do the routing, as you can see on that picture on the right side, but the 55 to 40 micron, it's similar to 55 to, of course your um, depth is less as it should be because 40 micron is a lot uh, tighter bumpage, so it's uh, going to be uh, placed together, right? Um, so physical layer, um, you know, we can, um, there is a notion of a module and you can have one module in a link, you can have two modules in a link, or you can have four modules in a link, as you see in the picture on the bottom. Each module is basically, it has got some number of, these are all unidirectional links, uh, mostly single-ended other than the clocking. Clocking is differential, everything else is single-ended. Um, 16 lanes, single-ended SE, sing, 16 lanes for standard for each cluster or module, and then 64 for uh, advanced package and uh, one lane for valid, one lane for calibration, tracking, we support lane reversal mandatory on the transmit side, part of the learning from PC Express, I wish we had done, we had fixed it in one side, but now what happens is people do in both sides, transmit as well as receive, but you know, you learn, right, learn the best practices. Um, uh, so lane reversal on the transmit side, and there is a reason on the transmit side versus the receive side. Normally on the receive side you are processing a lot, so you want to keep the latency lower, so it's easier to flip on the transmit side. Le le it's less uh, circuit in intensive. We support a range of frequency, 4, 8, 12, 16, 24, and 32. So if you support a given frequency, you are mandated to support all the lower frequencies and that ensures interoperability. So you don't have to worry about, do I design this to 16 gig, would the rest of the world design to 16 or will they be at 12? Well, no, it's just designed to whatever frequency is needed for your particular application. If 12 is the right number for you, go for it, go for 12, right, for the particular chiplet you are designing. And if you're connected with somebody that runs at 24 gig, fine, they will run at 6, 12 gig with you because that's the, functionality that you have, right? I mean, again, the same way we have with PCI Express, you, there we have the width and the frequency, and here you have the, the width comes in terms of the number of modules and frequencies, of course, all the frequencies are listed. We have sideband, and uh, it's basically two lanes in each direction, 800 megahertz, always on clock, one data, one clock. Used for training, debug, management, all of those things, and again, I wish we had defined a sideband in PCI Express right from the beginning, and then right now we get all, a multitude of choices, which becomes a little challenging, let's put it in this way. So this time around we said, hey, we're going to define it, what the sideband is. So that's that. Now, the next layer is die-to-die -die adapter. Uh, we do the flit mapping through FDI, and it's basically you know, responsible for doing the packetization. It sticks a flit header, does basically CRC, is responsible for doing link level management, like ACK, NAC, sequence number, all of those things, right? So die to die adapter sticks those in. Uh, assuming your, we define different bit error rates. If your bit error rate is 10 to the power minus 27, then you don't need CRC, but uh, you still might need the flit header. Um, and if it is 10 to the power minus 15, I believe, 18 or 15, 15, sorry, I could be wrong. But anyway, uh, 10 to the power minus 15, then um, you will need the CRC. So CRC is there again for um, triple, it, it ensures triple bit flip detection guarantee and uh, there is a replay if the CRC fails. And you know, this is the standard uh, 68 byte, 256 byte, which is from PCIe CXL, and uh, 256 byte latency optimized one from CXL 3.0. So now, uh, so UCI 1.0 was, uh, it was donated by Intel when we started the consortium in March of 2022. And after the consortium got formed, of course, you know, all the companies come in, they look into things, they say, hey, you know, okay, this, this, this works, we need to enhance this, right? All those things, right? That's where all the good discussion happens. So as I said, uh, in August of this year, we uh, announced the 1.1, which means, we, you know, we got more than a year worth of looking into the spec, clarification and all of those, not just that, but also new usage models. So there are four sets of things for UCI 1.1. One of them is automotive usage. We had made enhancements. The other one is streaming protocols with full stack, some cost optimization, and enhancements for compliance testing. So on the automotive side, there are three broad things. One is preventive monitoring for the link health. 
next is runtime testability. And last but not the least is field repairability to get around faults, right? And you know, the automotive guys really want to use the chiplets. That's the direction they see. So it's a lot of involvement in the automotive, uh, by the automotive uh, uh, group. So that's why we formed the automotive working group to look into all of these. Uh, let's look into those three aspects. Uh, field repairability, let me start from the bottom. That's an easy one. So we looked at what we had and we said, hey, we don't really need to do anything beyond 1.0, so done. Then looked into preventive monitoring. So we had all the things we needed. What, uh, what uh, we added was uh, new registers to capture the eye margin during link training. So when you do the link training, all of this information is available. That's how you are choosing the, you know, you're basically choosing the operating point that has got the best margin, right? So all that we did was we said, okay, whatever we chose, we just register that in a configuration register and that's there in a standard format so software can come and read. Otherwise, everything else is 1.0. Uh, testability, uh, so we actually had periodic parity fleet injection in UCI 1.0, so what we, and then there are mechanisms to uh, trigger that or not to trigger that, so th that those all existed in 1.0, and what parity fleet does is you can say, hey, after every 10 fleets you can program it, or after every 100 fleets, just send a parity fleet, right, so that way I know which lanes are failing. So, and actually you can even get the lane failure information from CRC, it's a reverse calculation, but you know, this is a more straightforward way. And the moral equivalent would be parity bit in the skip order sets in PCI Express. So what we did was, with 1.1 was, we defined per lane error log register to capture that information along with the counter and ability to send an interrupt. So those are the enhancements, right? So simple enhancements, but very meaningful in the automotive segment. Next is the streaming protocols on the full stack. So we supported streaming protocols and these can be things like Axie Chai, can be like our symmetric uh, multiprocessing cache coherency protocol because again, remember we want to build scale up systems using chiplets and use UCIE. And what we said at that time in 1.0 time was that these will be in the raw mode because we really don't know in the streaming protocol what fleet format they use, if they use fleet format or not, or you know, for example, if you are using like a networking thing, you just want it to be a bunch of bits, right? So, uh, but then, you know, as people looked at it, they said, hey, you know, uh, we really like this die to die adapter. We like the fact that it's able to multiplex between multiple protocols. Why would you not allow us to use it? And I said, okay, that's fine. If you want to use it, great, right? And we just didn't know who would use it. So as you will see in the next, uh, I think I have it in the next slide. Yeah, I have a uh, slide there. So effectively, you know, the, you, you know, uh, streaming protocol can choose to use CRC retry all of that in the die to die uh, protocol but most importantly the here's the interesting thing right a lot of usages people said is hey i want to use that pcie for things like you know device discovery dma all of those things are built in why would i go and innovate that allow me to multiplex my streaming protocol with PCI Express and allow me to do dynamic bandwidth allocation between them we had the mechanism to do that so we just enabled that so I know this is a busy slide, so I don't expect you to read through this, but these are the different formats. So there are six of them. The topmost one is the raw mode, and look into the streaming one, which is the rightmost column, right? So with UCI 1.0, only raw mode was supported for streaming, and everything else was not applicable, and you will see that with UCI 1.1, we just said, okay, fine supported for all. It's there, so it's just a question of if you decide to use the mapping, and we even had a lot of discussion around, does anybody need 68 bytes, or do you only need the, you know, latency optimized to 56, and you know, people had usage for each and every one of them. We said, okay, fine, it's easy to, you know, it's there, so just use it, right? Next comes around the bump map optimization. So. Um, you know, as bump pitches go down, we expect the data rates to go um, lower because, you know, at that point you, you, um, you are dealing with a huge amount of bandwidth and you would rather reduce the frequency and get more power, uh, get lower power, right? What we had defined was, so that's part of 1.0 spec, right? And what we had in 1.0 spec was the picture in the middle, the 10 column design. 
what we added in 1.1 is a 8 column design and a 16 column design and I'll explain the rationale. Same 388.8 micron bumpage. And the rationale is explained in this slide here. So if you follow the graph, on the y-axis you have area efficiency. This is silicon area efficiency. And on the x-axis you've got the pitch. This is again advanced package, right? So it goes from 25 to 55 micron. Now you will see that, you know, the 10 column, the area efficiency where it was with respect to, for example, 25 microns, so it goes that, that is the orange curve. Uh, the 16 column is the green one, and then the eight column is the blue one. So, what we did is, uh, we allowed for those saying, you are recommended to, from, for example, from 25 to 37 micron, um, you are recommended to use a 16 column design, 37 to 50 micron, eight, uh, 10 column design, and 50 to 55 micron, eight column design, and as a result, you get a lot better area efficiency. And again, still fully interoperable and not, not an issue. Most of the designs are 45 micron on right now, so it's timely for the lower, as the technology moves to the lower micron bumpage, uh, this is timely so that people get the area efficiency benefit. And this is illustrated in the picture there, again, um, for the different bumpages, you can take a look at it, right? So, Could you say for the area efficiency, what, what's the ratio between? So, so what is the area ratio? Uh, the area efficiency? Yeah. Oh. oh, yeah, so the question is what, what is the area efficiency, what, is the, what, what does that ratio really represent, right? It basically represents how much, if, I, if you got the most tightmost packing, you would get like 100% of the area efficiency. So this is basically representing how much bandwidth you could have received using that bumpage, and then how much did you really end up getting. It's a bandwidth. How much you would have gotten the bandwidth not, for? Not used area, unused area. No, no. Yeah, these are all bump limited still. So you're going to have, which is a good problem to have because you are going to be uh, left with, uh, uh, you know, uh, there is, the, the circuit is not the limiter here. The, it's the bumps is the limiter. The other thing with UCI 1.1 is reduced width. So things like FPGA, they, you know, we, we deliver a lot of bandwidth, so they cannot process all of that bandwidth within uh, a given stack. So they want to have multiple stacks, so they, they, they are going to be net aggregate bandwidth consumers, uh, but each stack they want to be uh, uh, less bandwidth, right? So for the advanced package, they said that we want to have 32 instead of 64 as the basic unit. So it's like a degraded mode. So if you have 64 and you connect to an FPGA with 32, for example, then you run it at 32 lanes wide. Right? Mm -hmm. Same way as today in PC Express, if you, for example, you know, a lot of the FPGAs would just run as two by eights instead of a single uh, by 16, right? So it's those kind of constraints. So we're taking care of those. Uh, next is around the compliance. So we made a lot of progress as a consortium in terms of how we are going to administer the compliance program. And basically the compliance goes uh, with reference known good package, reference channels, and golden die, and of course device under test. So both for standard package as well as for advanced package. And the golden die is something that you have proven, you know how the channels work and you get a device under test, you put that and you're going to do the compliance. Now, the thing I want to say is that doing a compliance program for an external interconnect is easy because you can probe. Here you need to be very careful because you don't have the access, right? Once you have packaged something, you have packaged it, right? So we need to, so we have given it a lot of thought. And I'm not going to go through a lot of these details here, but most of those are based on accessing the golden die through an FPGA kind of a thing. So file level compliance, it has got standard things like you know, voltage timing margin, bit error rate measurement, lane to lane skew, uh, all of those things. And the golden die in addition has things like it, can abil it has the ability to inject error, cause timeout, so that you want to test the error cases, same way with the die to die adapter. And for the protocol compliance, we expect it to be orchestrated through an FPGA. Now let's look, talk about the usage models for UCIE at the package level. So 
of course, we want to have SOC as the package level construct, right? I mean, uh, you want to have processors in the most advanced node, accelerator, mix, you got memory, you got all of these things, and you should be able to choose, right? Here I have shown like four compute dials, and you can have two compute dials, four accelerator dials, and that's basically the ability to have this kind of composability at the package levels, right? And again, we want it to be across all the segments. These are specific examples, like for example, if, and this looks similar to even if you look into our CPUs, like, um, like the switch, for example, you can have 128 lanes, that's your basic unit. You can put two of those dies together, get um, 256 lanes, or you can four of them together and get 256 lanes, and which is basically what happens today with our CPUs. You could uh, look into Sapphire Rapids, one tile, two tile, four tiles, you get the number of cores goes up, so standard constructs there. This comes from uh, you know, our friends at ARM and NVIDIA, and they said, hey, you know, this is one of the usages that they are thinking about. So Chai interconnect as the streaming for their compute dies uh, going through UCIE. And then if, they, if you want to have an accelerator, if the accelerator talks Chai, they will talk Chai through that, or maybe do multiplexing between PC Express and Chai, or they're going to, if it is just a CXL-based one, they will going to run CXL there. So, this is a, uh, I, won't, I'm, I won't have the time to explain this in a lot of detail, but fundamentally, um, you know, we have the ability to, with co-packaged optics especially, we have the ability to escape the package. And now, the notion of composability through UCIE-based retimer with CXL protocol, we can extend at a rack level and, across, and also across multiple racks. And that's basically fed by this slide here. We talked about the first row in detail during the talk, right? But look into the things like bandwidth density or bandwidth per sore line. So if, let's pick one of those numbers, right? Um, 188 to 1350. So what it means is that in every cluster, if it runs at four gig, I get 188 gigabytes per second per square millimeter. If there are two, I run, I get 376. If there are uh, if, sorry, if I run at uh, 8 gig, I get 376. If I run at 32 gig, I will get 1350 gigabytes per second per square millimeter. Just to give you an idea, PCI Express or CXL kind of thing, you are in the teens today. So this is two to three orders of magnitude better bandwidth density, which is what you would expect because these are very simple circuits, right? and we are still bump limited. This is at 45 micron, by the way. If you go to 25 micron, these numbers will go up by three and a quarter more. So we've got tremendous amount of bandwidth available. Power efficiency, 0 0.5, 0 0.25 picojoule per bit. It's an order of magnitude better than uh, external interconnect, five to 10 picojoule per bit. Again, that's what we would expect. And the uh, entry and exit latencies from low power state is 0.5 nanoseconds, not the tens of microsecond we see in external interconnect. And again, you know, those complicated circuitry, they need to retrain, takes time, all of that. So here is a simple thing, I just turn off the clock, I'm done, right? I save 85% power. Latency and order of magnitude less, two nanoseconds. And again, we include everything from the die to die adapter, it's all amortized, right? And reliability we measure in fit, which is failure in time, how many failures you are going to get in a billion hours. The number is 10 to the power minus 10, which is as close to zero as you can get. So we talk more, more or less the contents of these slides, right? I address them, you know, there are all of these four vectors. Now, yesterday we made an announcement that the first interoperability of UCIE between Intel design and synopsis on TSMC, that's we demonstrated. So this is the first one, of course, many more to come. So, this, you know, this is, like I said, this is his journey. We are, of course, on a very good, uh, this thing, uh, we're on a very good track here, looking at, you know, lots of IP vendors have announced availability of IP. I just talked about silicon interoperability, so the industry is, really far along in terms of getting uh, getting to start to innovate with the 
uh, with UCIE. And you know, we have other things that we are still working on. And this is going to be a multi-decade journey, right? I mean, things like you know, 3D, things like you know, manageability, security. There is a lot of interesting work going on. So join us if you have not done so. And with that, I might have time for a question or two. So first one is on optical mechanics, um, like you work with Iron Labs, are you looking at uh, standard for that as well? And the other option, uh, question I have is, uh, you had a lot of specs in there, I was curious about your specs for uh, impedance matching and things like that. So the second question was around impedance matching. So those are part in the part of the UCI file level specification. What was the first one? Sorry. Uh, things like, uh, Optical interconnects? Yeah. yeah. So for optic, so sec, the first question was around optical interconnects. So what we have defined is a notion of a UCI retimer, how it should work with an optical uh, technology. There are multiple op optical technologies available. So we have defined, you know, let's say uh, you do this, you hold off on this link training while you resolve these things on the optical side. So those are all all defined in the UCI specification. So. I'll be uh, outside if, if you have more questions and uh, thank you all very much.